Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me on this very rainy day where I'm at. I'm your host Sherry and you are tuned in to the dark side. Today we're talking about a murder that took place back in 1999. A 66-year-old widow who was well-loved by lots of folks would be found deceased in her home. This story is truly horrific and as a trigger warning there are details about sexual assault in case you want to shut this off now. My sources are listed in the description area. This is episode 107, the case of Angela Spence Shaw. This story takes place in 1999. Everyone was fascinated with the upcoming year 2000 and the whole Y2K scare. Albert Einstein was named the person of the century by Time Magazine. Skateboarder Tony Hawk became the first person to land a successful 900. The New York Yankees won the World Series. Legoland was opened in Carlsbad, California. M. Night Shyamalan released the timeless classic, The Sixth Sense. There was a massacre by two students at Columbine High School, and this was my senior year in high school, and I remember Dylan Claybold and Eric Harris were the same age as me. We were all on edge, as many schools around the U.S. were at the time. And in better news, SpongeBob made his premiere on Nickelodeon and is still going strong today in 2024. 66-year-old Angela Spence Shaw lives in Little Compton, Rhode Island. When I heard the name of this town, I thought it was hysterical. Compton is a city in California known in the 90s for extreme gangs, and the crime stats were some of the worst in the country. Anyway, this little town all the way across the country is called Little Compton, which is nothing like Big Compton in California. In 1999, Little Compton, Rhode Island, hasn't had a murder in the last 35 years. It's a quiet coastal town with hardly any crime. The average house is $797,000, and there's less than 3,500 residents. Locals say it is a very peaceful and quiet Rhode Island town. Angela Spence Shaw was born and raised in England and came to America with her late husband. She had been living in Little Compton for the last 20 years. She has two sons, both who live in Washington, D.C. She has four grandchildren. She was doing well as a widow living alone in her 60s. She worked part-time at Peckham's Greenhouse. The owner of this greenhouse says Angela could make a floral arrangement out of anything. You could give her just grass and some hay and she could make a beautiful piece. Angela previously ran the campus shop at the local college campus with her husband before he passed away. She was also a volunteer at Marie's Place, which provides clothing to the needy. She enjoyed watercolor painting, gardening, horticulture, and bird watching. She also loved horseback riding and was a member of the local stables. She won many awards from the Little Compton Garden Club and was next in line to be the club's president. On May 30, 1999, Angela hasn't shown up to the greenhouse for work. She should have been there about an hour and a half ago. Sarah Craig decides to drive to her good friend Angela's house and see why she isn't there. Maybe she is having car troubles or she's injured. What, whatever it may be, nothing could prepare her for what she'd find when she got there. When Sarah arrived, she immediately knew something was off. Angela's tan Ford Explorer was still parked in its usual spot and she sees water trickling down the driveway. It hasn't rained in days, so obviously something is going on inside that house. Maybe a busted water pipe and she's going to find Angela inside trying to figure out how to shut it off. Sarah knocks and doesn't get an answer. She checks the door and it's unlocked, so she lets herself in. She calls out for Angela but doesn't hear anything except a light humming noise coming from upstairs. It sounds like a small motor on an electric device. She goes upstairs and into Angela's bedroom, where she sees Angela's bed is stripped of all its sheets. There's a large blood stain on the mattress. The bed had been moved away from the wall, and a bloodstained pillow and pillowcase were found on the floor nearby. There's also a large blood stain on the wall. Sarah is in shock at this point and slowly makes her way through the rest of the upstairs, and she hears the humming noise is getting louder as she heads towards the bathroom. She goes into the bathroom and sees the body of her best friend Angela Spence Shaw is in the bathtub wearing only a pink nightshirt. She is completely submerged in the bathwater, including her head. The tub is filled to the top with water and it's overflowing. The humming noise was a hairdryer that was in the bathtub with her. 
She screams at the sight of her friend and calls 911 and then calls one of Angela's sons. The police and medical team arrive. At first glance, no one really knows what happened or if this was even a murder. Her body was in the bathtub and there was a hairdryer running. So is it possible she electrocuted herself? There's all this blood in the bedroom. Did she injure herself in the bedroom and go take a bath to get cleaned up and ended up electrocuted? Likely not, because she appears badly beaten and has these huge black eyes. The medical examiner will make the ultimate call about her cause of death. For now, the scene is still being processed as a crime scene. One of the first responders knew Angela and said she appeared unrecognizable due to the extensive damage to her face. As police move through the house, they note Angela had a lot of expensive items and nothing was stolen. Angela had $500 in her purse that was untouched. Her jewelry is still in all the spots it should be. They also said the first floor of the home was under heavy construction. There's plastic sheeting hanging everywhere, paint cans, tools, carpet is ripped out. It's obvious Angela had some major renovations going on on the first floor during this time. She was in the middle of having an addition added to her house. The police department only consists of nine police officers, and they haven't had a murder in this town since 1965. Some of the officers are so disturbed by the scene that they begin to feel ill. They know they are going to need some outside help to figure out what happened here and who is responsible, so they have to enlist the help of the Rhode Island State Police. Once the medical examiner's report comes back, it shows Angela was indeed murdered and the details are gruesome. I'll get into them now in case you want to skip ahead. Again, major trigger warning here. We learned that Angela was asleep in bed when someone entered her home. She was raped. We know this because the autopsy showed her genitalia was damaged. Swabs were done and it was confirmed that semen was found inside her vagina and also inside her rectum. We learned once the sexual assault was over, the person began jumping up and down on her, breaking her bones and damaging her organs. Forensic evidence showed this person had boots on. I can't imagine the pain this woman was feeling. She was still very much alive at this point. Dr. Elizabeth Laposada, who is the chief medical examiner for the state of Rhode Island, performed the autopsy and she said that even with all of her injuries Angela sustained, her pathways to perceive pain remained intact throughout the attack. This means she was alive, conscious, and feeling every single injury throughout the attack. Angela is then placed in the bathtub while she's still alive. The murderer plugged in the hairdryer and placed it in the bathtub. Her cause of death was determined to be drowning and substantial blood, blunt force trauma to her head. Friends and family say she didn't have any enemies. She was just a nice grandmother who lived alone and worked at a greenhouse and loved gardening. She didn't bother a soul. What the heck happened here? Now, we know there was a violent sexual assault, so police check to see if there's any sex offenders in the area. They learn there is a man in the area who is a sex offender. They show up to his house and he's kind of freaked out. He says, look, my wife will be back soon. What do you want? It's obvious he is keeping his sex offender past a secret from his family. He says he has nothing to do with Angela's attack. He agrees to give a blood sample and his blood doesn't match the DNA of the semen found inside Angela and he is not considered a suspect. Back to the drawing board for the detectives. During a meeting, one of the police officers mentioned, you know, there was a murder in this town 35 years ago. The guy is out of prison now. Maybe we should check into him. Police want to talk to a man named Stanley. So back in 1965, 22-year-old Stanley was charged with killing an 18-year-old girl who was babysitting. He stalked her outside of the house and murdered her. He was eventually released on parole. It's been 35 years, but police still want to talk to him just in case. They go to his house, but only his parents are there. They say Stanley was here a few days ago, but then he left. The detectives glance at each other. This info raises their eyebrows. They were finally able to locate Stanley after a couple days. He says, yeah, I heard you guys were looking for me. Here I am. 
Stanley admits that yes, he is a murderer, but he served his time. He says he was very young when that happened and he's not the person he was back then. He says he has nothing to do with Angela's death. The detective says there weren't any indicators or red flags while interviewing Stanley. He's not being shady and evasive. They believe him when he says on the night of May 29th, he was sitting on a couch reading a book. The detective asks him if he'd be willing to give a blood sample, and he consents to it. The blood did not match the DNA of the semen found inside Angela, and Stanley is not considered a suspect. At this point, they don't have any more suspects, so they go back to the scene to try to make sense of it there or see if there is something they missed. They did miss something huge. So, as I mentioned, Angela had a ton of work going on at her house. The whole first floor is undergoing major renovations. The police are very upset when they go back and realize they missed a giant hole in her wall that had been cut out, which was to connect the new addition that was being built onto the house. It's the size of a door. The contractors cut this giant hole and placed a plastic tarp over it. So basically anyone can come in the house at any time. Her house wasn't secure. The contractors who were working on her house were totaled up and there's 32 of them and they had been there for the last three months. That's a whole lot of men to interview and potentially get blood samples from. The detective wants to begin with the two men who had been the ones to put the giant hole in the wall two days before Angela was murdered. The first one says he was with his girlfriend the evening of May 29th and never left the house. His alibi was verified and he was ruled out. The second person was a young guy on the crew who was a carpenter and he's only 23 years old. His name is Jeremy Motika. He appeared handsome, and the police say he looked angelic. He had blonde hair and blue eyes and seemed like a nice kid. There's nothing about about him that stands out to police. He's not some hardened criminal. He's also not covered in scratches or injuries, which may be present on someone who just committed a murder. They need to interview him and determine if he could be the person. So if not, they can move on to the next person. The police learned that Jeremy did have a criminal history, even though he was only 23. He had been arrested two years prior for kidnapping and attacking a woman in Massachusetts, which is close to Rhode Island. Jeremy says that on May 29th, he got off work and went home. He had some teenagers living next door, and he goes over with them and hangs out and drinks beer and rum for hours. He's 23, so he's the oldest person there. He says he hung out with the teenagers drinking and carrying on until midnight or so. This is one of those instances that a person will go as far as to say they were doing something illegal in order to prove their innocence. He's telling the cops, I was drinking and providing alcohol to underage teenagers, but I wasn't murdering anyone. He says when he was done, he passed out in a chair in his living room. His girlfriend and baby were not home at the time. According to case law, Jeremy and his girlfriend live in Fall River, Massachusetts. I know this sounds far away because it's a different state, but these are small states. It's only about 25 minutes from Little Compton, Rhode Island. They live there with their infant son. Jeremy's girlfriend and baby were staying with her parents this weekend in Cape Cod. Jeremy had said he didn't want to go because of the Memorial Weekend traffic. So the next morning when he called his girlfriend, it's around 8.30 a.m., he tells her he's coming up to Cape Cod to see her. His girlfriend's surprised because she says, you know, well, just yesterday you you said you didn't want to come up here because of the traffic and whatever, but now you suddenly want to come up here. His girlfriend was interviewed by police, and she says that when he got there, he was super hungover, vomiting, irritable, and just a mess. He ended up staying in bed all day sleeping. So just to reiterate, Jeremy says he went back inside from hanging out next door with the teenagers around midnight. He says he passed out in a chair and was sleeping until 8.30 a.m. when he called his girlfriend hungover and says, I'm coming to see you. That's around eight and a half hours that he says he was sleeping, and no one can vouch for that except Jeremy. The detectives end their interview but give him their card and say, if you can think of anything else, just give us a call. But they are far from being done with this kid. They did another interview with him, and this time he changed his story. He says he got off work and went to a bar instead of going home, and he stayed there until 6 o'clock p.m. He also said he ordered a pizza from Domino's later that night and had it delivered to his house. He never told police this in his last interview. 
The detective goes to this Domino's Pizza to see if Jeremy really did order a pizza on the evening of May 29th. Luckily, the store had records for the last few weeks and say, yes, indeed, he did order a pizza, except he ordered it on May 28th and not May 29th. The contracting team all go back to work at Angela's house so they can finish the job. And while there, Jeremy spots a box that says, Rhode Island Forensics, Shoe Impressions. He calls his girlfriend and is angry and yelling for her to take his work boots out of the house and drive them to her parents' house in Cape Cod. One of Jeremy's co-workers, a guy named Kevin, he was one of the ones who made the big hole in the house. Remember, he was cleared because he had an alibi. He has the detective's card in his wallet and decides to give him a call. He tells him, look, my coworker is this kid named Jeremy. He's 23. He's acting really strange since you guys talked to him. He explained about how he heard him yelling on the phone for his girlfriend to get his boots out of the house. He says Jeremy told him that you guys were going to try to pin this on him since he has a criminal past. Jeremy also told Kevin he was worried about his fingerprints being found in the upstairs bathroom. Kevin tells him there's nothing to worry about because you haven't used the upstairs bathroom. Jeremy tells him, yeah, I use it all the time. He also said he used the bathroom sink to wet his hair a few times, so they might find my hair in there. Kevin says in the weeks they've been working on this house, he's never seen Jeremy go upstairs to the second floor. That area was off limits for the crew. Kevin has worked beside Jeremy every day for weeks. He knows where he's at all the time. So why would he say he uses that upstairs bathroom all the time? Kevin knows he hasn't been going up there. The detectives don't have anything to tie Jeremy to this crime. All they can do is possibly match the DNA. They ask him if he'd be willing to submit a blood sample. See, Jeremy has no idea that semen was found in her vagina and rectum. I'm not sure it was even public information at this time that Angela had been raped. The police pretend for a moment. They tell him they want to take a blood sample along with 23 of the other men to see if any of them matched the blood that was in the bedroom. Jeremy says, sure, no problem. They record Jeremy consenting to a blood test. It was determined that the semen found was a DNA match to Jeremy. On June 24, 1999, officers showed up to Jeremy's work and placed him under arrest for first-degree murder and first-degree rape. Jeremy is brought back to the police station and questioned for five hours. The detective had pizza, sodas, and cigarettes brought to Jeremy in the interrogation room. He needs him to be as comfortable as possible so he'll start talking. He described Jeremy as brazen, bold, arrogant, preposterous, and bizarre. They ask him if they can record his statement on how his semen ended up in Angela's body. He agrees to allow this. Jeremy says the reason Angela had his semen in her was because Jeremy would have sex with his girlfriend in the mornings before work. Then when he arrived at the job site, he would go upstairs and clean himself off over Angela's bathtub. I don't even know what to say about that. Jeremy's girlfriend said they never had sex in the mornings, so he's just using this as a way to cover his ass. In the previous arrest Jeremy had from two years prior... It was 1997. Jeremy hid in the backseat of a woman's car while she shopped in a convenience store. When the woman returned, he grabbed her from behind and ordered her to drive away. She escaped by pulling into a restaurant parking lot and jumping out of her car. According to South Coast Today, prosecutor Stephen Dambruck said during his bail hearing that although Jeremy may not have had a motive to kill the 66-year-old woman, he had the time, the strength, and the knowledge. He viciously and brutally pummeled her until he could have his perverted ways with her. Jeremy's trial begins in early 2001. He takes the stand and admits he lied to police, but he says he is no rapist or murderer. He says he came home from work, he was at home that night having drinks with the neighbors, then he passed out in the living room, he woke up, called his girlfriend who was in Cape Cod with her family, He went to the parts store to get a part for his car, and then he drove to Cape Cod. That's his story, and he's sticking to it. Jeremy's sister defended him. She says he's her best friend and is not a killer. He's a good kid who loves to cook. Jeremy's girlfriend said he did show up that morning at 10.30 a.m. He's hungover, vomiting, and extremely agitated, and he's just being mean and confrontational. 
The prosecution tells the court that Jeremy did indeed go home after work. He hung out with the teenage neighbors and then went to Cape Cod the next morning. We have witnesses and alibis to confirm this. No one is questioning that. The time that is in question is once he left the neighbor's house and up to when he left for Cape Cod. There are several hours in between those two events. Jeremy says he was sleeping. The prosecution tells the jury, no, he wasn't sleeping. He drove over to Angela Spencer Shaw's house in the middle of the night where he was just working at earlier that day. He went into the house through the hole he cut in the wall for the new addition. It was only covered with plastic sheeting. He walked upstairs and into her bedroom where she was sleeping. He covered her mouth to stifle her screams. He begins raping her, and then he starts jumping up and down on her body in his work boots. He broke her bones and damaged her organs doing this, all while her pain receptors were active and working just fine, as the medical examiner said, meaning she felt every bit of that. Then he began beating her, leaving blood all over her bedroom. He drug her down the hallway and into the bathtub. He turned the water on, he drowned her, and then he plugged in her hairdryer, turned it on, placed it in the bathtub to electrocute her. He goes home, calls his girlfriend, says he's coming to Cape Cod, and shows up vomiting and pissed off. Jeremy's lawyers say that Jeremy consumed 10 Heinekens and an entire bottle of rum. He could barely stand up, let alone drive 25 minutes to Angela's home in the middle of the night. During the trial, there was a lot of talks about the DNA evidence, since that is the only thing that links Jeremy to the murder. It's 2001 at this point, and DNA evidence in court isn't like it is today. There were talks about how reliable or unreliable, rather, it was. According to South Coast Today, the defense criticized the state's Department of Health, saying it lacked the expertise to conduct the DNA tests, and the tests themselves are unreliable and irrelevant. Robin Smith, who is the supervisor in the Rhode Island Department of Health's Division of Forensic Biology, testified that blood samples were done on 23 of the contractors. She said she was able to exclude 22 of those, but she couldn't exclude one that was a match to the DNA found in the semen, and that match was to Jeremy. When asked about the probability of someone having the same genetic profile as Jeremy, She said it would be one in 36,000 people. For perspective, this town only has 3,500 residents. After hearing the arguments from both sides, the court sided with the prosecution, and Jeremy was found guilty for the murder and rape of Angela Spence Shaw. Jeremy sat quietly and emotionless as the verdicts were read. Cries from Angela's family were heard from the other side of the courtroom. Jeremy's mother stared at the floor. Angela's son passed a handwritten note to the reporters who were waiting outside of the courtroom. It thanked all of the officials. The note read, Because of the efforts of these people and many others, we can now go about remembering our mother as the warm and wonderful person she was and always will be. On Friday, April 27, 2001, nearly two years since the murder, Jeremy is at his sentencing hearing. His lawyers asked for leniency since he was impaired by alcohol, but Jeremy is sentenced to the maximum sentence, which is life in prison without the possibility of parole. The reason he got the maximum sentence is because the jurors determined that Jeremy inflicted pain beyond what was needed to kill the victim. He just kept going and going. The judge called him the personification of evil. He got taken back to prison to begin serving his sentence, and we don't hear much more about this case until 2017 when Jeremy requested a hearing to get his over his conviction overturned. According to Amanda Milkovitz for the Providence Journal, the high court said that Jeremy was entitled to an evidentiary hearing on the merits of his application and should be appointed a new lawyer. Jeremy claimed innocence and violation of his due process and equal protection rights. He also claimed that his trial lawyer was ineffective, accused the prosecutors of misconduct, and raised questions of double jeopardy, insufficient jury instructions, and abuse of judicial discretion. Nothing really came out of that, though, and the case has been closed. Jeremy today is 49 years old. He's been in prison longer than he was not. 
He remains incarcerated at the Rhode Island Maximum Security Prison. This prison holds a maximum of 430 inmates, so it's pretty small. According to the Providence Journal, inmates went on a hunger strike in 2022. This was to protest the antique ventilation systems and lack of air conditioning, toxic mold, skin lesions, rodent infestation, contaminated water, and abusive medical staff. If Jeremy wouldn't have left his semen, he may have gotten away with it. A forensics team would have found his fingerprints, but his lawyers could argue that he was a contractor. His fingerprints are supposed to be in the house. As well, if he wouldn't have gotten caught, he would likely do it again to some other innocent person. I struggle with trying to find a motive here. The motive wasn't robbery. He didn't take anything from her home. She wasn't his enemy. Angela served these men lemonade in her home and stayed out of their way while they were working. She was friendly and warm to Jeremy as he and the others worked on her house. So it wasn't like she wronged him in any way. I think he saw Angela as an easy target who wouldn't put up a fight. Psychologists say Jeremy is a sociopath. A sociopath is someone who has disregard for other people. They don't care if they hurt others. They have impulsive behavior. They lack empathy and have a need to win every single time. Angela couldn't outpower Jeremy. She was 66 years old. He's a 23-year-old carpenter who's in good physical condition. She really didn't stand a chance against him. Angela would be 91 years old today in 2024. She is known for her amazing gardening skills, her love of riding horses, her ability to create beautiful floral arrangements, and the love for her two sons and grandchildren. She came to the USA from England, and I am so sorry and ashamed this happened in my country. She deserved to be safe and spend the second half of her life enjoying time in her garden and with friends and family. Rest in peace to Angela Spence Shaw. That's it for this week, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care, and much love to you all. Intro music is Feral Angel Waltz, which is composed by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All his music can be found on his website, incompetech.com.